All right, welcome back everybody. As we continue to explore different topics related to conformity, let's continue to talk about obedience, but this time let's focus on some factors that influenced obedience during Milgram's classic studies. Milgram found such a high rate of destructive obedience during his classic research that sometimes it makes us wonder if we're all evil. The good news, of course, is that no, we're not all evil. Remember that virtually all of Milgram's participants were tormented by that experience. Many of them wanted to stop delivering shocks, but they simply couldn't overcome the persistence of the experimenter. So in other words, many of them couldn't overcome the power of that situation, the power of that authority figure. That said, there are character or personality variables that do indeed make a difference when it comes to obedience because some people are simply more likely to be obedient than others. In fact, participants who had an authoritarian personality delivered more high-intensity shocks to the learner in Milgram's classic research. Authoritarian personality tendencies can be assessed with a questionnaire that's known as the F scale, and in this case, F represents fascism. Fascism is an authoritarian, nationalistic, right-wing system of government and social organization. And people who have high F-scale scores tend to be relatively rigid in their thinking. They tend to be ethnocentric. Interestingly, they're sexually repressed. They're relatively intolerant of dissent. They like it when people follow orders. They like to follow orders. And they are punitive. When people don't follow orders, they think those people need to be punished. So these people, you're probably able to predict, are somewhat submissive to authority figures, and also they tend to be relatively aggressive toward their subordinates, um, those people, of course, who have less power or less stature than they do. So based on those characteristics, you can see that people who have an authoritarian personality are perfectly suited to follow the experimenter's orders to harm the learner. However, personality factors like authoritarianism mattered much less than three situational factors when it came to predicting obedience to authority. Milgram ran many different variations of his study. In fact, by running more than 20 different variations of his basic experiment, he was able to identify several factors that influence obedience, leading people to be either more or less obedient. Three particularly important factors are the legitimacy of the authority figure, the physical proximity of the victim, and various details of the experimental procedure. Let's talk about those three factors next. Let's work our way through this graph, and as we do, we'll be able to identify several factors, the ones we just talked about, that really have a systematic influence on people's obedience rates. First of all, I think it's always interesting to keep in mind that we're talking here about obedience to authority figures. We're talking about obedience to the commands of an authority figure. So remember, when Milgram ran this study using a control condition that received no commands, no prompts, so people were not prompted to continue with the study. They were not told that they have no other choice. In those situations, very few people were fully obedient all the way to 450 volts, just about 3% if I remember correctly. Another important thing to keep in mind is that when Milgram ran his baseline study, his original typical baseline study, he found no differences between males and females. They were equally obedient. So in other words, there were no sex differences. Now as we get into some of the other variations of the study that Milgram ran, we'll be able to see how different factors really did influence obedience to authority. So for example, Milgram found that destructive obedience, which he was studying, required the actual physical presence of some prestigious authority figure. So in this particular variation right here, Milgram took his study from Yale University, which is very prestigious, and he moved it to a building just kind of in the suburbs. So in that situation, when volunteers would arrive to be run through that study, they would no longer associate that atmosphere with Yale University. So now we're talking about an experimenter who doesn't have the same level of prestige. And you can see in that situation, there was considerably less obedience. In fact, in this situation, obedience rates dropped to just 
This helped Milgram understand that the status of the authority figure was important. In fact, he ran another variation of the study where he just had an ordinary person in charge of the study. So the experimenter wasn't that person who commanded so much respect. The experimenter in these situations was typically supposed to be known as just another subject. Now, of course, in that situation, that person was also a confederate, but in that case, the confederate appeared to be just another subject who was tapped to run the study on that day. And in this situation, again, you can see that obedience rates were quite a bit less than they were in the original baseline study. In this variation of the study, obedience rates dropped to less than 20%. And again, Milgram was very interested in studying various aspects of that authority figure. And one aspect has to do with where is that authority figure? Is he in your face or is he maybe somewhere more remote where you don't feel as much social pressure? And Milgram ran one variation of the study in which the experimenter was in a remote location and he would literally phone in the orders. So he wasn't there barking orders at you directly, but he was phoning them in. And in that situation, again, you can see that obedience rates dropped considerably compared to the baseline study to somewhere around 20%. So these three variations that we just talked about all tested factors related to the perceived authority or status of the authority figure. Another key factor that influenced obedience rates had to do with various issues related to the victim. So for example, when the learner had to be seated in the same room as the participants, overall obedience rates dropped to about 40%. It's this next experimental variation that I always find the most interesting. In some situations, the participants were required to touch the victim and they were specifically required to take that victim and hold his hand on a shock plate. Just think about that for a second. You'd be in an experiment you're delivering shocks to this learner. You're realizing that this learner is in pain. He doesn't want to continue in the study. You're told that you have to go on. You have no other choice. And you take that person's hand and you force it down on a shock plate so that he receives a shock. That is one crazy social situation. And I'm always just so surprised to see that full obedience rates are right around 30%. I would have predicted it would have been much less. In, in fact, remember, when Milgram asked people, psychiatrists, college students, people from around the community, what percentage they thought would be fully obedient in just the baseline study, the people thought virtually nobody would be fully obedient. And in this case, when people have to grab that person's arm and force it down on a shock plate, we still find 30% full obedience. That, that's crazy. That is just crazy to me. That, that just tells us so much about, about human behavior and how influenced we are by some authority figure. So these experimental variations tested factors related to the teacher's physical proximity to the victim and the teacher's interaction with the victim. In general, the closer the teacher is to the victim and the more interaction the teacher has with the victim, the less obedience Milgram observed. Milgram ran another really interesting variation of his baseline procedure in which the teacher was around two other teachers, at least they appeared to be teachers, they were confederates, who at some point rebelled and they refused to go on. Well, in this situation, the actual teacher only was obedient somewhere around 10% of the time. And that helps us understand that when we have allies, when there are other people doing the types of things that we'd like to do, it emboldens us. And in this case, seeing people who rebel emboldens us to be defiant. So via this graphic, we talked about two of the three key factors that I identified previously. One key factor that influences obedience is the legitimacy of the authority figure. Another key factor that influences obedience is the proximity of the teacher to the learner. Let's talk about that third factor next. Remember, there are various details of the experimental procedure that influenced obedience rates. Let, let's talk about some of those. For example, one thing that's important to acknowledge is that that experimental situation was completely new for every single one of those subjects. Not one of those subjects, not one of those teachers had ever been in this situation, so there were no norms for them to follow. Most people simply didn't know how to behave in that environment. 
Another interesting detail of the experimental procedure that influenced obedience rates had to do with the fast pace of the experimental procedure. Remember, things moved pretty quickly. And when things move quickly, it's pretty hard to scrutinize your situation and really understand the consequences of your actions. It's also hard to take some time and think about your own values and then allow those values to guide your behaviors. In other words, it's hard to evaluate all of your options. So in really any situation that is fast paced, it's often hard to make logical, well-reasoned decisions about your behavior. That's why we often think back on social situations and we say to ourselves, if I could do that over again, you know, this time I would tell that experimenter off. And that's because at that point in time, we've had some time to actually think back and think about what we might have wanted to do in that situation had we had some time to think it out. So although we know ourselves relatively well, we often need sufficient time to figure out how our intended behaviors should coincide with our value system. Because of course, most of us value the health of other people and we don't want to harm other people. And in this particular situation, people just really didn't have enough time to consult that basic value system and see how their behaviors didn't really coincide with that value system. Another interesting detail about the experimental procedure that influenced obedience rates was that the shocks increased in intensity very gradually in small increments. So this reminds me a lot of the foot in the door technique. Remember, if I ask you for a small favor, I'm more likely to get a large favor later on. Well, the participants in this study started out by delivering just 15 volts. That's not much. Once I've delivered 15 volts, it's not such a big deal to add another 15 volts and then deliver 30 volts to the victim. And then once I've delivered 30 volts, what's a big deal? Let's add another 15. You can see we can go on and on and on with that until we get pretty quickly to some pretty dangerous levels of shock. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the participants may not have felt that they were actually personally responsible for the victim's welfare. During Milgram's experiment, particularly when the learners started yelling, the teachers would ask the experimenter, who's responsible if the learner back there gets hurt? And the experimenter would often say, I'm responsible. And that's often all it took to successfully prod the teacher to continue delivering shocks to the learner. Now, I'm sure you understand that when the experimenter claims responsibility, it still doesn't make it right that the teacher would continue shocking the learner. I'm just trying to help you understand that it was in that situation that the teacher no longer felt as personally responsible for their actions. Thinking back on Milgram's classic research, it's really just amazing how much we've learned about human behavior. And for years and years, I taught students that there'd be no way that we can do any type of follow-up research because of all the ethical problems associated with Milgram's procedure. That said, in 2009, Jerry Berger received IRB approval to conduct a partial replication of Milgram's classic study. And I gotta tell you, I was so surprised. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't understand how somebody could use that procedure today, given all of the problems that we know. And Berger did use Milgram's original procedure, but he added several safeguards to help protect his participants. For example, Berger's study ended at 150 volts instead of 450 volts. And that's because in Milgram's original study, nearly all the participants who continued past 150 volts went all the way, eventually, to 450 volts. So in other words, a willingness to continue past 150 volts strongly predicted a willingness to be fully obedient. So let me just point that out here in the graph. In Milgram's original study, you can see that people dropped off when the subject started screaming at about 150 volts. But at that point, very few people dropped off. Most of those people who went on after 150 volts went all the way to 450. So it really doesn't make sense to continue the experiment all the way to 450 volts if we don't have to. If we can figure out how many people will get to 150 volts and then continue to go on, we've got a really good indication of how many people would be fully obedient. Berger had some other safeguards in place as well. To further protect the participants, he carefully screened them. He wanted to weed out people who might get too stressed out by the experimental procedure. And he also repeatedly reminded all the subjects 
that they could withdraw from the experiments at any time without any penalty. With all those safeguards in mind, the IRB viewed Berger's procedure as relatively safe, and that's why he got approval. Well, let's talk about his results. Although Berger's study was about 45 years after Milgram's original studies and much has changed in our world, obedience rates didn't really change all that much. About 83% of Milgram's participants were willing to continue delivering shocks past 150 volts, and about 70% of Berger's participants were willing to continue past 150 volts. Like in Milgram's study, there were no differences between men and women. Interestingly, obedience rates declined only slightly when participants saw a defiant confederate refuse to continue to about 63%. So based on this data, obedience to authority is still a shocking problem in today's society, but it might be somewhat less of a problem today than it was in decades past. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>